up to that time, he was simply a truth seeker like all other sincere human beings. Prior to his embodiment, he knew, but through his infancy and childhood, he did not know. In the same way, Narajuna did not know, except that he felt this strange urge which caused him to depart from his own faith and take on another belief. Some may say that this might have led to complications for the good man, but it did not, because Hinduism at that time was strangely tolerant. Um, sages and holy men moved about, tra transferring their allegiances with considerable freedom, and there was very little religious persecution of any kind. So in all probability, his former teachers sent him on to other teachers with a blessing. In any event, there came to him the inner realization to magic, to incantations, to whatever rites you want to consider, the books are dim, the stories are plentiful. Uh, he became aware of the existence of the Sadhana Pundarika Sutta. He knew that it existed. He knew that it was the great esoteric book of Buddhism. He knew that it was the great discourse in which the secret of the large vehicle was to be revealed to the world. And he started out, pilgrim-wise, to find the book. And he knew what he was looking for. He was looking for the secret place that was guarded by the king of the Nagas and all the faithful people of the serpent. And these same people of the serpent, by the way, occur on our western hemisphere. The Ketchum Quattle was the feathered serpent. The aspects of the Mayas were called the Great Serpent, and their subterranean temples and galleries were the serpent's holes in the earth. And here under the earth, the secret mysteries were revealed. So we have the same tradition moving everywhere. And uh, Nagarjuna knew that the serpent had placed the great treasure in the Iron Tower. So the Iron Tower has been a subject of art and controversy also for a long time. What was it? We learn in the old scriptures that the planet itself was believed in the old times to be girdled with a wall of iron. Also that a great iron band or wall guarded the sanctuary of Nero, the mountain of the world. The Iron Tower, therefore, seems to represent a term of infinite protection. And from the oldest diagrams and figures in which the Tibetans particularly attempted to picture it, the tower resembles a small reliquary or oriental pagoda. It consists of a, of a square base supporting a short cylinder which tops itself in the form of a half sphere. On this is a sort of roof, square also, with the little pitched ends of a pagoda. And out of this, in the center, rises a spire, surrounded by nine rings, and surmounted by the blazing pearl. This little pagoda form is still found all uh, of where Buddhism is known. It is still a reliquary. It is most usually found on the properties of monasteries as the abode of the spirits of the great priests who have gone before. It may be built over a relic, some small uh, remain of a physical priest. But the, actually, the great the, uh, golden pagoda at Rangoon, the Shwe Dagon, the golden dragon, is such a pagoda in the Burmese form. The great box of uh, Siam are also such pagodas. And in China, we have them rising like little buildings of several stories, like towers. Whereas in Japan, we are more apt to find the old Hindu or Tibetan style predominating. Somewhere was the Iron Tower. And in the Iron Tower, the mystery of the law slept, waiting revelation. And by his magic, Nagarjuna was able to find the Iron Tower. Some say that when he reached there, an ancient sage was dwelling near the tower. 
Some say that this sage was a vision sent uh, from another world, as the vision of age, sickness, and death was sent to the young prince Gautama before he became a Buddha. Some say that uh, Nagarjuna was instructed by this sage and that this was the real secret of the whole thing. Others say, no, this doesn't quite explain everything. But anyway, however it may be, the wise men, the Nagas, whether they be adepts or sages, whether the iron tower was a symbol of the eternal Shambhala, the abode of the gods, whatever the mystery may be, from the iron tower, Narajuna received the Lotus Sutra. Now, all those who wish to say that he wrote it and the rest of it is a legend, who can deny them? Who can affirm anything? The only thing that we can say is that if he did write it himself, the rest is fable. He produced one of the most extraordinary works in the history of the world. So he produced something by means of which the teachings of a lonely Indian mendicant, honored, loved, venerated, but seldom understood, these teachings were made available to the great mass of the Asiatic people. And from this sutra and its implication arose what we know as the wheel of the great doctrine the Northern School, the school that transformed Buddhism from a patient waiting for the unknown to a dynamic building towards an enlightened human society. Some will say, and the Southern Buddhists insist, that all this was a sustaining of the teachings of Buddha. But if you study the Mahayana scriptures carefully, and there are others that came later beside the one of the great law, the other sutras, of course, are commentaries and interpretations by the great patriarchs of the various schools. But this one unique sutra has been held in common by all northern Asiatic peoples. It is the foundation of Lamaism in Tibet. It is the foundation of Chinese Buddhism. It was the great power that created Japanese Buddhism. It was present to a modified degree, but rather strongly in Korea. Wherever the great motion of Buddhism passed, it contributed to the glory of it. It gave the world the wonders of the Buddha Badur in Java, and the great cosmological monuments that are still to be found in the most remote parts of China. No longer, unfortunately, can we visit them. In any way you wish to look at it, uh, a new dispensation occurs. And this is traced distinctly to the opening of the doors of the Iron Tower. From that time on, the new revelation uh, was prepared for the service of mankind. And Nagarjuna, if he invented it, if he wrote it, uh, merely elevated himself to one of the highest places uh, known in the levels of spiritual consciousness. It is unlikely that he wrote it. It is most unlikely, because he was but a recent convert from Hinduism. Had he written it, he would have most certainly involved in it much more Brahmanical philosophy. Like all Buddhism, he borrows some, but not excessively. The only other possible explanation is the one of the sage who we met at the Iron Tower, who may have had an older concept. Some have tried to insist that the doctrine was in existence among certain sages for a century or more before Nagarjuna. It is all myth. It is all legend. But out of this strange, legendary foundation arose something that was not legend in any sense of the word. As a result of the gradual interpretation of this sutra, uh, which was copied with the commentaries of Narajuna, also Narajuna prepared his own commentaries 
by which he was elevated to the estate of the 14th patriarch of the great descent. And even sects that do not follow precisely his instruction uh, still acknowledge uh, that he is of the highest order of canonization, that he is one who is already a bodhisattva, to go on to still higher achievements in the northern school. We now have the primary differentiation between the two schools. We have, first of all, the doors of Buddhism strangely open to all men. Buddha opened the first gate by disregarding the caste system. He declared that regardless of birth, regardless of race, regardless of affiliation, the individual could attain enlightenment that there was no person so ignorant that inevitable enlightenment was not his by a right beyond any power of man uh, to destroy. But Buddha did not uh, clearly indicate the difference between the clergy and the laity. He created, and probably very wisely in his own time, because after all he was establishing a school which was later to unfold, but he had to give it body. And he did this for the Sangha. He established the orders of the monks. And during his lifetime, he lived to see this community increase in number, regain honor and distinction, and he also established the monastic orders for women. But the northern school, the revelation of the Blue Lotus, suddenly opened the way of salvation to persons not dedicated to the clergy. The uh, way of salvation eliminated the absolute requirement of monastic orders. The Northern School held firmly uh, that illumination, enlightenment, spiritual progress, growth and unfoldment were based entirely upon virtue upon integrity, upon the individual performing to the very best of his ability those duties and responsibilities which were his natural requirements. Therefore, it is perfectly possible for the householder, the parent, the child, the individual who continued to be a shopkeeper, who practiced the professions, who did whatever uh, was naturally his occupation, his redemption, his illumination, his regeneration, resulted from his faithful maintenance of the integrity of his own activity, whatever it might be. He was not to become an arhat by no longer being a physician, but by becoming a greater physician. He was not to wander off into a loneness if he was an attorney, but he was to stay and judge righteous judgment. Whatever he was doing, this was the area of his karma. Here it was that he must fulfill his message, his ministry, and his purpose. And all good deeds accomplished by him contributed to his enlightenment, just as certainly as privation or detachment from worldliness. The Mahayana took the, the idea that this detachment was not a walking out on worldliness, but a detachment from selfishness, from self-seeking, from all these negative or destructive attitudes by means of which we exploit or betray the tasks and duties which we should properly and nobly perform. So this was the, this was the next step in the great motion of Buddhistic democracy. It had already extended to the animal kingdom and accepted the animal as the brother. It had extended itself to the mysterious beings of the invisible worlds, ghosts, demons, monsters, and formed them all into acolytes of the Buddhistic order. Now it was to transform the problem of Buddhism itself. From the secret books of the Iron Tower, it was also pointed out that there was the heart path to realization. That the heart represented actually in Buddhism by the assembly of the bodhisattvas was a sure a path 
a certain road to illumination. As any reasoning, any meditation, any abstract discipline, any self study But actually, the wise man and the good man, these two are one. Both have achieved exactly the same end. For wisdom must end in goodness. And that which is good is truly wise, regardless of all other things. So the good person, is to the individual in whose heart and mind there was the continuing remembrance of the law, Education this is constituted to the heart path to enlightenment. So it was certainly this approach that captured the heart of Asia. It was this approach which resulted in the triumphant march of Buddhism across a third of the surface of the earth. It also contributed everything to the great artistic cultural heritage in which Buddhism became uh, so closely uh, identified. Here was the inspiration of a great art. Here was the reverence and the gentleness of the subtle hopes, the mystery of a world of beauty and truth. It was concealed from the common state of man, who made by a very thin veil. It seemed under such conditions that almost anyone at any moment might see these luminous figures rise before him. If he looked at the sunset, he could see the radiant head of the Amida circled by the halo of the setting sun. Everywhere, the universe became filled with light beings. And by degrees, these light beings overcame all the shadows which had held men in fear and doubt and bondage for ages. The Northern Buddhist school suddenly gave to man an invisible universe of beauty with which to surround him. It gave him a universe of infinite hope. It gave him the solemn assurance of the sages but all would come well. Those who and in this system, because of its complete lack of, almost, to say, complete lack of any trace of intolerance, there was no longer any war of creed. Men did not uh, fail because they belonged to another faith. Mahonan, the great Buddhist mystic, describes how the saints of other religions have all achieved Bodhisattva. But all the good and the pure and the noble everywhere are part of this glorious company of the radiant ones. So the universe suddenly became almost as in the apocalyptic vision of the blue lotus, an extent of beings as far as mind and consciousness could conceive, all chanting together the glory of the doctrine, all bearing witness together to the infinite wisdom, infinite graciousness of truth, a cosmic revelation of beauty, a universe of principles, all of them benevolent, in which there was no evil principle, no power of ultimate evil anywhere, evil being only man's ignorance, being the darkness which he has cast upon himself. So this vision, of course, was in some way tremendously accepted. We can understand why this would be. We can also understand why in local periods when times were fortunate, as in the ages of, age of the Fujiwara in Japan, uh, great princes and kings, the rulers of the highest families, both men and women of the imperial house, resigned their temporal honors and took holy orders. Emperors became monks. Empresses became nuns. And the great and powerful nobles united together in their efforts to create on earth a visible commonwealth based upon the mysteries of Amida's Western paradise. The idea was to beautify everything, to make the whole world a sanctuary of beauty and of good, to transform this earth into a wonder similar to paradise. In this, of course, they had a certain basic indoctrination from the northern school in which it was assumed that it was the task of the Buddha Gautama 
to transform this planet into his eastern paradise and rule over our world as Armida ruled over the paradise of the West. So everyone was helping or trying to help or thinking about helping to make this great beauty a reality. Obviously, these tremendous spirits of uh, idealism could not be maintained. Uh, the uh, intensities of life would not permit it. One by one, these ancient shrines were deserted, or at least became merely uh, great treasures of nations uh, to be shown to travelers, even to be used still for religious purposes. But there was this tremendous outburst of divine hope. And this was represented in the uh, final culmination of most of these Buddhist schools in Japan, where alone we can study them today, there is practically no other place where we can study them. Uh, and that is the rising of the ten or twelve schools, according to different classifications uh, of Buddhists in Japan. The first two schools, those which came under the direct supervision of Kushokutsu, belonged to the southern school. They were the severe school of the renunciation of the world and the Arhat wandering into the loneliness. But they vanished away and little remains but their monuments. And almost immediately, the northern schools took over Japanese country. It was firmly established for the 7th or 8th century. Then came the burst of art. Then came the wonderful unfoldment of architecture, of music, of the theater, of literature, of all the craft and artistic procedures. But gradually the tea ceremony, the flowering, the no drama. All these things came out of this tremendous impact of artistry. You can study any subject and this whole artistry is you know, almost completely an effort to capture in some way this apocalyptic vision of the Lotus Sutra. In, many cases, in, uh, in some way this sutra has become the inspiration for all that followed after. In the Chinese versions, in the early printed forms of the Sung and early Ming dynasties, the sutras are illustrated with great panoramas indicating the assemblages. Similar, similar paintings exist at Chonghuan and Tufan in Xinjiang and in Chinese Turkestan. These great uh, symbols uh, are also captured in the idea of the Buddha of Kamakura in Japan, the seated Buddha which we all know so well, uh, over 40 feet in height. This quiet meditating figure is an effort to capture in the majestic proportions of its size, something of the vision of the Lotus Sutra. The great Buddha Virakarma at Nara, that is much larger, also represents uh, the idea of the great teacher in his body of universal life. The only way they could even indicate it was uh, by increasing the size or dimension of the image. This process goes on throughout all the symbolism. In all these symbols, we find the historical teacher of Baltimore, not lost, not gone forever, but submerged in the vast manifestations of himself. Behind all of it is recognized the strange likeness of himself. So it was his own extraordinary revelation which created in man the archetype of all that was to follow. But upon this archetype was built a tremendous structure of interpretation, which finally represented, was represented in the rise of the northern sect. Today we have in Japan and in China, where we can get at them, Hong Kong and Formosa, in Korea, where they can be reached at all, and in other isolated areas, formerly in Tibet, still in Nepal. We do have the continuous functioning of the northern system. We have Gautama not so prominently displayed, but assumed and implied. For every figure of the Buddha that exists is merely an expression of the Gautama form. They're all based upon the one form. Every one of these transcendent beings in all their glories are nothing but a representation of Buddha at the moment of his illumination. All the wonderful bodhisattvic robes and jewels and adornments 
all based upon Prince Siddhartha before the Enlightenment, when he was Prince of Kapitavastu, and therefore in his full royal habiliment. All the quiet, shaven-headed monks and all the arhats are merely Buddha the Wanderer, are wandering around in uh, Bengal looking for teachers that could give him the instruction. For all images are nothing but an extension of him. But in the course of this extension, this tremendous symbolic process, uh, these extensions have taken on certain individualities of their own. They are so regarded and venerated. But it is incorrect to say that they are working. In the, the northern school, we have several sects, such as the Jodo and the Shin and the Jodo Shin and the Hongwanji, and many other sects, including the Nichi Renshu. Uh, these are Japanese schools. Every one of them adore the Sutra, the Lotus, of the Law. All of them are revelations based upon the strange, a rather intense and rough personality of Shonen Nichiren. This man was always belligerent, always a stormy force in the life of the country while he was alive, who lived in its stormiest period at the time of the threatened invasion by the host of Kublai Khan. This man, in his meditation, was seeking to give the people of Japan not the but interpretation the of, the of the greatest, sermon, the most important, the and most profound concept to be found anywhere in Buddhism. He wanted to give them honest, the soul of the Buddha. And obviously and inevitably, he revealed it to them through the Sutra of the Lotus of the Good Law. It is the sacred book of all the Amida sects of Japan and some others also. It is very strong in the undercurrent of Zen, though not so obvious. In every instance, it is the revelation of a great universal life principle. The universe unfolds as in the apocalyptic vision of the Sutra itself. To be an infinite world of infinite growth with all things moving inevitably toward peace, toward a great happiness, not an extinction, but a reunion with life, not a ceasing, but a oneness with the magnificent thrill of eternal existence. Not the darkness of oblivion, not the dying out of everything, but the gradual dying out of error until relieved of this, and with the inner light of his own consciousness, man looking at the sunrise, looking out over the mountains, looking into the cities and towns, looking into the eyes of his own children, sees everywhere the magnificent pageantry of the lotus everything filled with light, everything filled with infinite beatitude, everything thrilling and moving by laws that are immutable. And these laws are forever mercifully administered by those who understand them. For the laws are revealed to those who know them. The great body of the law through the enlightened power of the Buddha Shakyamuni, the great author. All the transcendent interpretation, all the subtle mysteries of hope and faith, and kindness, all the healing power, the consoling forces, all administered by the great Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Here the whole universe consists of dedicated souls serving the law and bringing all life uh, to conscious insight, oneness with the purposeful. There is no strange emotionalism such as we have in some other religions. It is not an emotional faith, but it is a faith of great quietude. And out of this great quietude, this solemn assurance of all things, it comes a kind of emotion that is a little difficult to understand, but is definitely there. 
It is, that it is the emotion of a strange, transcendent certainty, an emotion in which the bereaved does not weep for the lost one, but has some strange, quiet, and perhaps a little sad realization in himself that all of this is part of the infinite process of infinite good, that everything is within the light that shines from the urna, the great coiled pearl of light on the forehead of the infinite Buddha. That as this light shines into all places in space, it reveals worlds that we do not know. It brings light into the most obscure corners of creation and eternity. But wherever the light strikes, if it goes off into some distant star, if it goes into the uttermost parts of space, wherever this light strikes, there will be found the assemblies of the Arhat. There will be found the gracious faces of the Bodhisattva. There enthroned among them will be the Buddhas of the ten directions of space. Everywhere the law. Perhaps what Buddha wanted to try to carry through in this was the transcendency of the law itself. Not a law that we can comprehend fully, but a law beyond any question of God. The time of the temptation scene uh, the, the strange moment when Buddha awaited illumination under the bow tree. So the hosts of Mara came to tempt him. And universal confusion closed in upon him in an effort to turn him from the quiet internal realization which he saw. The hosts of the material world symbolized by Mara in the uh, profitable and proud way of living. We own all things. Those first lessons we are masters of them. Value to them throughout we are the kings life, and the emperors. To the future of the world. And all we have degrees all possibly earned. All authority. It is very important now. And we have a whole creation of ignorant, but nevertheless highly opinionated beings that are ready to testify to us. They will bear witness to our power. They will bear witness to their daily thoughts that they fear Caesar. They will bear witness in every moment of their lives that most of all they want to perpetuate their physical existence even though it corrupts their soul. We have witnessed that materiality is supreme. The Mara turned to the Buddha who was just painting and lightning. And he said, it is Who do you have to bear witness? Buddha made the mudra, which is found on many of his images, called the earth witnessing. He puts his hand down and touches the earth. And when he does so, the great earth mother, like the wonderful editor of the Nibelungen, the great earth mother rises before him. And she says, I bear witness. I am the great mother of all the lives. I, I am the one whose infinite laws, infinite processes, processes of birth, is going to prove growth, that the divine things the are stronger and more processes of little birds coming from the eggs, processes of the right grain growing in the field. The processes of the trees heavy with fruit. With processes we may not know where, knowing where to go in migration. Why we need it. Everywhere. We study history, we know we these have processes. And these the things will gradually clear themselves. And these processes we call nature. The Earth Mother said, I am nature. I bear witness I think that, we can that every law of nature has to come back as witness to the truth of this body. This was not only the beginning of the earth witnessing, but probably was one of the roots of the Lotus Sutra. It is one of many intimations that are found in the earliest records. For Buddha, with his hand in the earth witnessing posture, is known much earlier than the attributed date of the founding or discovery of this sutra. So the earth witnessing episode, while probably legendary also, goes back very far. But its main purpose 
is expressed by the teacher in his own words. But he asks no one to believe anything unless they can prove it in daily life. The daily life, the happiness and the sorrow, the coming and the going, the rising and the falling, all of the things that happen every day, these bear witness to the law. The law is not based upon revelation, so God pronounced it. No vast conspiracy of heaven decreed it. It is eternal. But everything that exists witnesses it. And the perfect witness of the law, that in which it is entirely embodied, is the mysterious golden figure seated in the midst of the universe in the lotus suit. Seated upon the lotus of nature. Is well worth what it rising by the very processes of eternal growth, seated forever in the absolute the composure of complete acceptance, there throughout the world. this figure symbolizes in right, a strange way an extraordinary achievement possible to make. It can be accepted, it can be rejected, it can be held to be an answer, or it may be denied. Some will not consider that it is religious at all. This is a strange proclamation of religion. But certainly, moving across the face of Asia, it became the most civilizing power that the East has ever known. And in many respects, it accomplished for them a civilizing influence that the West has never known. Because the West has always looked upon space the great void to be conquered by man. It is a great emptiness to be filled by human ingenuity. Man was a creature, space was nothing. Man was a being, space was beingless. beingless. Man has a mind, space is mindless. This has been the common thought. While we held religion, we never permitted it, in many, in most instances, to dominate our conduct to the degree that it modified our ambitions. Then we have to work in the West, when the when the thinker looks out into space, he sees only a mystery extending on and on and on through physical extension to infinity. But the Buddhist, looking into the same direction of space, if he uses the outer eyes of his body, sees exactly what the scientists. No. But in the quietude of himself, something happens. He begins to feel something. He discovers within himself that this space is not empty, that he is not alone, that his own kind is not unique or the only thing that was ever produced by nature. And in his meditation and his mysticism, the extension of his own mental processes, his intuitive processes, his inward imagery, suddenly causes this space to blaze out as a magnificent universe of value. He sees life everywhere, law everywhere, beauty everywhere, truth everywhere. And to him, those who have gone before in this infinite path of growth, turn back and learn as kindly elders, as dedicated friends to help him. And this whole hierarchy is that of dedication. No man might see these strange half-open eyes looking at him and through him. And perhaps in a moment of uh, inner vision, he might turn to see if they are looking at something behind him because they do not seem to be focused directly on him. This is true of practically all these images. And if he gets this feeling, he is correct. The image is not looking at him. The image is looking at infinity. Behind the man who faces the image is an infinite process of existence. This face is looking past him to the roots of himself into the animal world, into all the creatures of the elements, mysterious creatures we know nothing about, plants and minerals and atoms and electrons. This saving face is not devoted completely to him. 
It was only an incident. The great process of salvation. The face of this meditating power must redeem all that exists. It must find, understand, share, enlighten even the tiniest electrons. Everything must move into this great pageant. It must unfold its, its, its divinity and its beauty. So it becomes likewise the shining servant of eternal truth. This was the vision of the Lotus Sutra. This is what Nagarjuna said contained in the iron tower guarded for the purpose. They mean that it was the eternal doctrine held in secret by ancient orders. Peace, perhaps if Buddhism is correct, brought from other worlds and other suns and other aeons into this world of ours. Like the mysterious, fabulous pagoda floating in space, in the inner vision of the Lotus Sutra. In any event, this to the Buddhist is the supreme achievement of his faith, his sudden discovery of the living universe. Their Universe alive in spirit and soul and in mind. Everyone will be real. Universe of Everyone infinite wisdom and infinite life. love. No one will be Manifesting right. forever in infinite take care of the children. This was the, the apocalyptic vision. The and and the tracing of it and the story of it and the legends around it now, are among the most fascinating and interesting of now, all the Eastern stories. Well, I think our time is up, so thank you very much. Our Lord, as I said, our various false doctrines, not in that return, but false policies, false doctrines, false beliefs, false allegiances, until we now feel that we are just about the most perfect creatures that ever lived. But if we take a second look, we have to revise the estimate somewhat. We have to realize that in this last generation, we have broken no more natural laws. We have misused more natural products. We have involved ourselves in more unnatural situations than ever before in history. We have broken rules that our ancestors didn't even know existed. We have done everything that we could just to do what we want to right now. And the circumstances don't mean anything because we're going to be dead anyway. This thinking has got to go. And if it doesn't go any other way, we'll go in great wars and atomic bombing. But it doesn't need to. And we are assured that if many fall because of their iniquities, the just person shall not be moved. We will not fall individually or collectively if we keep the rules, serve the truth, and do our daily chores as best we can. We will also have peace of mind, peace of soul, and because of doing it right, we have to have better health. And the individual will no longer not dead or a heart attack at 49. All these things come as a result of changes in our way of life. Live straight and we'll live straight. Live straight and things will work right. Do all the things that we can to the best of our ability and pass on to our descendants a heritage of good examples. If we will do these things, we will not have much else to worry about. We can then go peacefully along in the day enjoying the arts and scraps, partaking in all those things which are useful, but avoiding carefully any form of activity which is unnecessarily harmful to any other creature. Live harmlessly, as Gandhi said. Live as far as we can to help the world rather than to hurt it. Not, uh, not out to, you know, to slaughter animals, but to take care of them. Not out to slaughter human beings, but to save them. And not out simply to enslave, technically, even though we do not use the term, millions of human beings. All these things will cause trouble. And we must, if we correct the mistakes in ourselves, we will end most of the world's suffering. And the school should teach this. The school should teach that every student is a potential force for good if he is willing to accept the responsibility. And if he is not willing to accept its responsibility, it is foolish indeed for the community to educate him. But he will, with proper example and proper encouragement, proper, proper inspiration, 
accept this standard of better living. He will be proud that he can make, be part of a generation that makes a contribution to the future. All these things are possible to him, and he can do them. But he needs a little help at this time. The schooling should begin to teach him what he should be, instead of preparing him to fit like a robot into some prearranged economic system. The whole theory of robot economics that we know now is a dying theory. It will not last. It cannot go on. It can never be profitable. But it will fascinate all kinds of people who love gadgets and who think of all change as progress. And every new complication is a thing of beauty and a joy forever. This type of thinking is not any good. But if we work with it properly and the schools will get back and to getting to the truth of the matter, getting to the facts that we know are true and which we can prove from 5,000 years of written history and 50 years of current misery, all these things we can learn, understand, and take into consideration. If we can get together, we can become the members of a planet and the earth itself will be the great schoolhouse. Here we will all be here as A.B. Sedarian students in the College of the Holy Spirit. That is what the Rosicrucians call it. We all are in school. It doesn't, it doesn't show from here much, but this is the little red schoolhouse. And we're all in it. And it's time to graduate more students with honorable marks for having done it right. The time of playing hooky and being prudent and not doing the lesson and trying to escape the responsibility. These times are passing because the world simply cannot support the abuses which is then heaped upon it. The time has come for the regeneration of these things. A universal reformation of human relationships is the emphasis upon a unity in the world family and the recognition that we are all one group and that this group depends upon its own inner structure for survival. And if we work together, we can survive, we can protect resources, we can do all kinds of good things. But if we keep on paying other people to do it for us, we're going to be in the same condition we're in now indefinitely. It's time for us to do our own thing and do it right. Well, I'd like to also announce that uh, tomorrow evening my wife is having her uh, weekly, monthly meeting in uh, Monday evenings 